computational complexity. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to, to Kumran and to everyone who helped organize this wonderful workshop. It is excellent to be, uh, to be back here at the Simon Center. I always have a great time when I come here. Uh, so I was asked to give a title about 10 days ago, and I gave exactly this title. And uh, results were in progress, and they, uh, we have results. It was clear that there was going to be something to tell you about. What I'm going to tell you about today is uh, a little less about DS than I had originally hoped, though uh, ask me some questions at the end, and I'll happily make some comments uh, along those lines. Really, the focus is going to be on, uh, on vacua and, and on computational complexity. Uh, computational complexity is, is a field within theoretical computer science. Uh, and the first half of the lecture is going to be introducing some of the basic concepts from that subject uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page so that when I start talking about uh, some of the ideas related to vacua, we're, we're, all, we're all on the same page. Um, for anyone that is very familiar with this subject, uh, I'll apologize for two reasons. First of all, for reintroducing something that you know already. And second of all, uh, the, I'm going to emphasize intuition over sharp, sharp, sharp precision definitions and rigor. Uh, part of the reason is that I think that some of these concepts are relatively easy to understand if you put them in a simple way. But, uh, but, but if you give the super precise version that you might see in a, in a computer science textbook, uh, they're a little more complicated. So I'm going to emphasize that. Um, yeah, Dave Morrison overheard me say that last night, and he said, what? You're not going to be rigorous? And uh, I, I'm going to emphasize intuition. So, so um, there's three questions that I'll start with. <laughs> so, so there's, I'm going to start with a bunch of questions. Uh, one is just the, the basic question, and this is sort of how we started thinking about it, are we faced with important problems that are really hard? Uh, one of the problems with that question is that it's not even clear what you mean by hard. What's, what's uh, hard for me might be easy for many of you, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's not clear what, what that really means. Uh, on the other hand, there is this field of computer science called computational complexity that in a sense tries to quantify what is, what is meant by hard. Uh, at the beginning, I should, I should mention that there's a little bit of work on this in string theory. The, the seminal paper is Douglas and Deneff from 2006. Uh, if you are interested in getting your feet wet in this subject, that, I think, is probably the first physics paper to read, at least uh, unless my knowledge of the literature is incomplete. Uh, with Miriam Svetich and Inaki Garcia Echebarria, we had a paper in 2010 along those lines, but in a, similar, in, in, in a slightly different vein. Uh, and then there were two papers last year, one of Douglas and Deneff, and one of Ning Bao and Raphael Busso and company. Uh, that, that was last year. As far as I know, there's about, there's about uh, four papers, or, or maybe a couple more that I'm forgetting, on computational complexity in, in the context of string theory. So I recommend that you look at those. Uh, throughout, uh, complex for me is going to be computational complexity. Uh, uh, that's what I'm going to mean when I say the word complex. But one of the key things is to ask the question whether something being computationally complex or not means that the problem is impossible or that you should give up or that it just isn't really worth approaching. Uh, this was actually how I got back into this subject since my work in, in, in 2010 on it. Um, there's a whole bunch of... Uh, so-called heuristic algorithms for different computationally complex problems that uh, computer scientists try to come up with very good algorithms that are as fast as possible for dealing with, with some of these problems. Uh, and they have a wide variety of applications, both in science, in, in, uh, in finance, in machine learning, uh, in, uh, so on and so forth. Sometimes it's very, very useful to be able to solve some of these problems. So for example, uh, Amazon warehouses, uh, they often, if you order many, many different types of things, they have to have some way of efficiently going around and picking out those things and, and being able to, uh, to, to get them to you in a timely manner. That's actually a, a computationally complex problem that's related to the so-called traveling salesman problem. Uh, another question, if you want to approach this, is whether you can use artificial intelligence or reinforcement learning or machine learning to tackle this. Uh, and the answer is, in certain cases, yes. I don't, uh, ha I don't want to say much more about this stuff today. This is sort of my entry back into the subject, but I'm, I'm really not going to say anything about these things today. Um, and then sort of the bigger, the bigger question, which is sort of uh, in the spirit of Douglas and Deneff's original work and also their, their more recent work, uh, is that... 
what happens if there's a computationally complex problem that is realized in nature? Uh, then there's the question of how is it that nature solved the problem in the first place if it's such a hard problem? If are problems that are hard for us to solve hard for, for nature to solve? So that's, that's sort of the spirit of the question. Uh, I'm mostly going to focus on super concrete results that are related to vacua and a background on computational complexity. But if one wants a sort of bold question to have in the back of one's mind, one, one can ask such questions. Uh, right. Right, so uh, protein folding is one example of a system that's actually realized in nature where there's a computationally complex problem that nature actually solves. So, okay, so this is the background. Uh, this, this is the background, and I'm now going to begin the first part of my talk, which is on complexity. And I, I want to give you three references here. One is a book that we found very, very useful in getting... Uh, some of the results uh, that I'm going to present in the second half. Uh, and this is a book by Vivasis from 1991 called Nonlinear Optimization and Complexity Issues. Uh, there's a very long and thorough manifesto by Scott Aronson. Uh, the title, if you just Google it, is P question mark equal to NP. Uh, there is a website that is... Uh, called the Complexity Zoo that can introduce some of these things. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about it is that it has, it has sub-regions of this website. So if you go there and you want to learn about computational complexity, if you're new to this, like, uh, like I think most of us, myself included, am, there's, there's something they call the Complexity Petting Zoo. So if you're looking to just get your feet wet a little bit, they, they have a petting zoo that is not the full version. Um, very good. So. Uh, Th these are the references that I recommend. Uh, I'm going to give you an example in a second, but the basic definition uh, in complexity theory is to have something that you might call a problem. And a problem is just a map from I to B where I is called the set of instances, an instance of the problem. And then depending, I'll, I'll be more precise within an example in a second, uh, the set of instances um, and and uh, the question is, given an instance of the problem, can, can, is there an algorithm that, com that computes this, that solves this problem f? Um, one more simple definition is that a decision problem uh, has that the target is yes or no. So with the decision problem, you're effectively trying to answer a yes-no question. But certain yes-no questions can be hard or not. So um, in some of the work I did in graduate school on this, decision problems appeared uh, in the context of, does this particular divisor in a Calabi Yau threefold, when you put a Euclidean D3 instanton on it, have a particular instanton zero mode or not? Yes or no? So there are all sorts of physical questions that we care about that, that have yes-no answers that to determine the physics output, you need to answer the yes or no. And that is what a decision problem is. So I'll give you an example that will feature prominently. Um, I, I should have said, by the way, that I'm going to give this basic introduction to complexity theory. But then at the end of this hour, I'm going to review some of the results from Douglas and Deneff along the physics lines. Um, so. An example is a problem called click. A click is uh, a set of mutually connected nodes. Of a graph G, undirected graph G. OK, so you're given some undirected graph. You want to know, is there a subset or not that that is mutually connected. Is there a click? And a, a, a click of k nodes we'll call a k click. So the, the problem click, and it's common in at least what I've seen in the complexity literature, to when you define a problem to write it in all capital letters. So click is the problem given an undirected graph g and an integer k, a positive integer k, you want to ask the question, yes, g has a k click. Or no, it doesn't. Okay, 
So this is a simple example of a decision problem, because this is some problem that you can ask in graph theory. It's, it's a discrete math problem. Does g have a k-click or not? The answer is yes or no. And uh, the complexity issue comes in when you ask about what sorts of algorithms actually, actually can tackle this, and what is their time dependence on the size of the graph and the size of the integer k. Um, a few remarks uh, that, that I, won't, I won't write down. Uh, is just I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about algorithms that compute f. Basically, uh, don't worry about uh, about sort of this story. The idea is, is that there's some problem, and we want some algorithm to solve some problem that we care about. And uh, we might say that the algorithm computes that problem. Of course, depending on the problem that you have, there might be many different algorithms to tackle the same problem. Some of the algorithms may, may be terrible from the point of view of how long it takes to run on your computer, and others may be uh, much, much better. In particular, I'll refer to polytime algorithms or polynomial time algorithms as algorithms that solve the problem in, in, in a time that is bounded by a polynomial in the input size. Okay? So there's a question of how long an algorithm takes to answer the problem. A polytime algorithm is one that's polynomial time. Uh, if it's not polytime, I'll refer to it as exponential time. The idea is, is that in that case, the, the algorithm that you're studying is, is an algorithm that uh, scales as an exponential in, in, the, in some input parameter size. Uh, at, at, so there's these two different types of algorithms, polytime and, and non-polytime, or exponential algorithms. Very naive question. Sure. So from the physics viewpoint, we are naturally left asking the first version of the question you raised. What does hard mean? What does hard mean? Yes. Yeah. So is this notion duality invariant also? The notion of computers. So could it be that in one description you say, oh, this is an impossibly hard computation, and the thing is trivial? Yeah, so you're talking about different algorithms for the same problem. Well, we yeah. don't know why it would have The difference is that in the cases that we are using this, that's right. we don't have a deep understanding. That, I think that's a great example, actually, of, of some problem that you want to answer physically about some physical system. In one duality frame, the algorithm by which you would compute the answer is very difficult and maybe exponential time. And in another duality frame, it might be polynomial or exactly. So is that not an invariant concept, this complexity? Uh, right. So, so um, it is, for any fixed algorithm, you can have different algorithms that do uh, the same thing. The, some of the basic results involve the idea that there may be no polynomial time algorithm that does the thing that you want to do. In any frame. In any frame. That's right. That, that's, um, that's related to this P versus NP problem that I'll get to in a minute. Yeah. But, but um, part of what you can say is there's no currently known polynomial time algorithm. Exactly. Yep. For any given problem. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's analogous to not knowing what duality frame to go to. The That's absolutely right. So you may have some problems for which there is no known polynomial time algorithm, which would be the analog of not having a duality frame to go to. Um, or, not or, or not knowing which, which one, right, that's right, not knowing what it is, so not knowing which duality frame to go to to do the problem in a faster way. Uh, another thing that can happen, which is, it, is part of why there's some real meat on this story, is uh, uh, maybe I'll get to it in a minute. I, I definitely will get to it in a minute. But the basic idea uh, that puts a lot of meat on this is that in some cases we believe if p is not equal to np, which is what c many computer scientists hold, then there is no polynomial time algorithm, period, full stop. So there is no duality frame that you could go to in this language which would allow you to compute it in an easy way. Yeah. Um, translating back and forth between this language and physics is uh, something I'm sort of doing on the fly. So apologies if it's not totally clear. Thanks, Dave. Yeah. There are problems. Prove have no time or not. If p is not equal to np, then yes. There are problems. Not known. It's not known. Problems, and I'll get to this. There are problems yeah. which are complete for p equals. That's right. So if you could solve this particular problem in polynomial time, you could solve all. Yep. The you guys are five minutes ahead of me. I'm getting there. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> You guys are five minutes ahead of me. Uh, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm really trying to review all of the basics of complexity theory in, the, in this first hour. Yeah. Um, OK, so there's this important question of polynomial time versus not algorithms. Uh, and what's known about this basic problem? Uh, we'll get there. Um, it's, it's very hard. <laughs> it's, 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 every pair should be connected. Exactly, exactly. A, a click is that every pair should be connected. Uh, we will, it is a theorem that uh, click is what's called NP-complete, and I'll tell you what that means. Um, yeah. So, all right. Yeah. So this is, is this an example of uh, what do they call 
these problems are still very, very hard, very quickly. Um, Erdos. Uh, I I'm not familiar with that comparison. So uh, this is this is this is NP complete. So NP complete is one of. So let me tell you about complexity classes. So I've distinguished between a problem, different algorithms that might solve the same problem, the fact that those different algorithms might have different time scales, exponential or, or polynomial. But uh, let's talk about some classes. This is a place where I will uh, be intuitive uh, and not, right, I'll be more intuitive. So definition, uh, P is equal to the class of problems With, poly with polynomial time solution algorithms. Okay, so this this is this is this is a good thing. If a, if a problem is in P, it means that it's relatively easy compared to an ex exponential problem for a computer to solve. N P is the class of problems with a, a, a poly time verifier. This is a different type of concept. You can one type of thing you can do with a given problem is try to solve it and ask about the difficulty of that. But you may also have some friend that gives you a candidate solution. And you can ask, given a candidate solution, can I check in polynomial time whether that is, in fact, a solution or not? So checking problems, Checking a proposed solution to a problem versus producing the solution yourself is sort of at the heart of this complexity issue. And then the big question this is literally the million dollar question. This is one of the clay math problems is P equal to NP or not? Uh, I'll mostly let you think offline about what it would mean if P were equal to NP, but basically the heart of the question is is it as in. If this were true, it would mean that for it, it's always, in a sense, as easy to find a solution to a problem as it is to check a proposed solution to a problem. Pardon? It's obviously not true. It's way easier to check that something solves something than to So if you prove that, you will win a million dollars. It's common sense. Come on. <laughs> OK. So one of the things that I am going to be using throughout the talk is the wide expectation that is obvious, uh, uh, apparently. Uh, that P is not equal to NP. It is, that is the consensus in the computer science community, but this is an open problem, and if you actually prove one way or the other, it is an open problem, but, but if you prove it one way or the other, it's, it's a million dollar problem, but the wide, wide, wide consensus is that P is not equal to NP based on this intuition that producing solutions to problems and checking proposed solutions are fundamentally different things, and it seems obvious that they're not always equivalent. Okay. But could be lots of different rates. Right. I mean, That's right. Linear as opposed to Absolutely. Absolutely. So Dave, Dave is raising a good point that there's different degrees of polynomials. And if you all talk about exponential, there's a base to the exponential. You could say that perhaps you have an algorithm that goes like 1.00001 to the n. When we talk about complexity, we're really talking about sort of asymptotic complexity. As n goes to infinity, uh, exponentials will beat polynomials. Yeah. That's right. And a lot of these issues that you guys are raising are actually things that are discussed at length in the very beginning of this Aronson review. So um, the, it's, it's really a great place to, to, to learn about some of these issues. OK, uh, very good. Uh, great. So I need to keep moving. And uh, yeah, non-deterministic is what that means. Uh, what <laughs> P, uh, problems in P are ones that are uh, solvable on a, on a deterministic Turing machine, and uh, N is for non-deterministic Turing machine. And this is where I'm intentionally dropping precision, because I think this is already intuitive enough. Um, yeah, it does not mean not polynomial. <laughs> yeah. If the solution comes out a certain way. That's true. Touche. To Touche. The original meaning is non-deterministic. Yeah. Yeah. So. OK. Right. All right. So. Because this is an open question, we need, to, we need to develop some sort of useful notion that we can take to the bank in the absence of knowing the answer to this question. And that's what complexity theorists have done. Jim, yes? I don't know. I, I don't know these problems. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. 
Okay, so we'll. We'll need another definition. We need a way to relate problems to one another if we want to talk about their relative complexity. So um, if a, a problem f from some set of instances to yes, no uh, can be polynomially reduced, I'll just say reduced, to another problem, g, from a different instance set, i, if there exists a map f from i prime to i, such that uh, f is polytime, there's a polytime algorithm for f, and f of x is equal to yes, if and only if g of little f of x is equal to yes. Okay? This is just the formal definition that basically basically says, all right, there's two different problems. I'm going to relate them via some polynomial time map. And in particular, if I know how to solve one, I know how to solve the other. Okay? So that's that's the idea. And in, in particular, throughout, I'm going to write I, this is my notation. Uh, I don't know. Maybe other people use it. If f reduces to g and uh, is polytime reduced to g, then I'll write f reduces to g. Okay. So the reason that this is a meaningful concept hmm? uh, Yeah, that would be sort of mapping different algorithms. Uh, one might be able to phrase it that way. That, yeah, um, yeah. That du duality, as we've sort of discussed it here, is about the, the fixed problem, different algorithms for computing the same problem, and this is about relating different problems in a sense. Duality, is sort of different ways to think about the same problem, if you'd like. Uh, well, a priori. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. A priori, they might look like different problems, but yeah. Um, I was pointing out a, a, a problem with your notation, which is that that definition looks like g is reduced to f. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, because you had your mapping from the inputs to g to the inputs to f. Um, you yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Good. OK. So now that we have this notion that allows us to relate problems in a polynomial way, and in particular, if f reduces, reduces to g, and I can solve g, then I can solve f. Right? So uh, definition, another complexity class, f, I, f from i to b is said to be NP hard if there exists a G reduction to F for all G in NP. Okay? Uh, okay. This is uh, an, an important point right here. Um, right. This is an important point right here. I have a bunch of remarks, but I'll, I'll say them rather than write them because they'll take a little while. So what this means in particular is that if you have a polynomial time solution algorithm for f, then you can turn it around and solve every problem g in NP. So in particular, a polynomial time uh, algorithm for an NP hard problem uh, would prove that p is equal to NP because you can use the polynomial reduction that NP hard by definition has a polynomial time reduction for all problems in NP to the NP hard problem. So if you solve one, you can invert the map and, and, and solve all of these NP hard problems. So, so uh, I'll just put the remark in quotes because it's important. So if you solve an NP hard problem, by which I mean find a polynomial time solution algorithm for, put poly solve, this implies that P is equal to NP. That's, that's the spirit. So in particular, because of this expectation that p is not equal to np, then uh, if, if, that, if this is true, then there does not exist a polynomial time solution algorithm uh, 
for that for that NP hard problem. For any NP hard problem. Okay? So this is, we don't know whether P is equal to NP or not, but this is where it sort of starts to get some meat. Uh, because if it is true, as we think, that P is not equal to NP, then there is no polynomial time solution algorithm for this thing that we've defined to be an NP hard problem. And then the question is, are there any NP hard problems? And are they ever relevant for things that we care about? Um, right. Yes, and furthermore, uh, if you have one NP hard problem that reduces to another NP hard, uh, sorry, if, right, an NP hard problem that reduces to another problem, that, that, that second problem is automatically NP hard also. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, the final definition before a few examples. A problem uh, is said to be NP complete if it is NP and NP hard. So uh, this is where I draw the obligatory Venn diagram. Uh, this is going to go up, so I'll put it here. I have some room here. Maybe I'll put it here. So So P sits inside NP. It may be equal to NP, but we, we think it's probably not. Uh, there are problems that are at least as hard as any problem in NP. Those are called NP hard. If a problem is NP hard and also NP itself, it's called NP complete. Um, the other containments, yeah, this is, this is containment by definition uh, of NP complete. Like NP hard is strictly larger than NP. Uh, I don't know the. I don't think. I don't think that's known. Yeah. But P is contained in NP. P is contained in NP. That is the key. That is the key containment that is known. Uh, a lot of the rest of these are open. Yeah. That's right. Cool. So. And you don't care whether the NP complete problem is on or not. Well, the N. Complete as being from P? Yes. Is that obvious? Uh, or is that just a if, if P is not equal to NP, uh, then they're disjoint. Yes. There is no poly if P is not equal to NP, then there is no polynomial time solution algorithm for any NP complete problem. So they're not intersecting. Okay. Yeah. I get the impression you knew that answer, but you wanted me to say it differently. <laughs> No, I mean, your Venn diagram is assuming P is not equal to That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that's right. So my Venn diagram is assuming P is not equal to NP. Uh, this whole diagram would sort of collapse down if they were equivalent. That's right. Thank you. OK. So let's do a few examples. I'll give uh, the first example ever of an NP complete problem. And then we'll do some physics. So uh, we'll have some Boolean variables that I'll call xi. Um, by literals in those variables, we mean the variable itself or its negation. Uh, by a clause, I mean an or of literals. So, uh, you know, x1 or x3 or not x10. Uh, a CNF formula, this is just one example. A CNF formula is a way to take an and of clauses. For example, x1 and x2 or not x1. And finally, we say that uh, a CNS formula, CNF formula is satisfiable uh, if there exists an assignment 
of truth values, zeros or ones, to the xi's, such that the CNF formula evaluates under the Boolean expression to one when evaluated on that assignment of variables. This is what satisfiable means, and then you can, you can a, a, define a problem, and this is this famous problem SAT. SAT is the problem given a CNF formula, given this type of Boolean string. Uh, determine whether it's satisfiable or not. So that's the problem SAT. So uh, it seems sort of esoteric and in discrete math computer science land, uh, but this is actually the first. So, so, so the, the problem, again, is just to, 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 given any sort of ands and ors combined of Boolean variables like this, you just want to ask the question, can you assign zeros and ones to those variables such that that formula evaluated on that assignment is one? All right, so uh, theorem, this is. Some people just attribute it to Cook. I've also seen other people attribute it to Cook Levin. Um, so there exists a polynomial time reduction to SAT for all F in NP, and therefore SAT is NP complete. Okay? Uh, sorry, they, they also, uh, and also, uh, it's also true that it's NP. So uh, given any string and any conjectured uh, solution and any conjectured assignment, you just plug them in and check, and that's polynomial. So it's also NP. So this is, this is NP hard, this is the NP, and therefore SAT is NP complete. And this is the Cook-Levin theorem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I was reading Aronson, and he said, this is, this is in every com computational complexity textbook there is, because it's this main theorem. As I understand it, the basic idea behind the proof is that these, these algorithms, these deterministic Turing machines that are actually doing the calculation the way that a classical computer would, are ultimately just uh, uh, doing a combination of Boolean operations anyways. So there's sort of a natural map from the way that a deterministic Turing machine would act to one of these CNF formulas in a way that the answers of one are related to the answers of the other. That's sort of the, the gist of it. Um, but I haven't talked much about the, the, the Turing machines themselves. Um, yeah, so, so it, it, that might not be the right way to go. But in a sense, a classical computer is, is using these sorts of CNF formulas and Boolean algebras to to do various types of computations. So that's sort of the natural map that exists between an arbitrary NP problem and SAT, and that's what the theorem shows. Since you said the term classical computer, yes. I'd like to say the term quantum computer. I would love to at the end. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm running out of proper length chalk. Um, OK, great. So uh, finally, I'll say one more thing, do a couple of physics examples. And then we can break. Uh, so this is, yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. OK. I'll, uh, Um, yeah. So another example, like I said, is this problem click. Just lost half the chalk. Remember that click is, is the problem of given an undirected graph G uh, and an integer K. You're asking the question, is there a subset of those nodes, of K of those nodes, such that they're all connected to each other? Such that any two of the, any pair of them is connected. Uh, a theorem due, I believe, to CARP put a question mark, but I think that's right, is that uh, click. So, so in particular, I'll be a little more specific. SAT reduces to click. And because if you have one NP complete problem reducing to another NP complete, to another problem, then click is NP, com click is NP hard. It's actually also NP complete. So this gives you NP hardness, but it, you can also show that it's NP two and therefore NP complete. And this problem click is actually 
uh, relevant to another problem that's related to scalar potentials. Okay. All right. That's enough uh, non-physics for now. Uh, what I want to start talking about on this board is two examples uh, from the paper of Douglas and Deneff, 06. Again, to my knowledge, this was the, the first paper about computational complexity in the, in the context of string theory. Highly recommend you read it. Uh, there's a number of examples in there, but there's sort of two that they focus on. Uh, one I will call ADKCCs. These are cosmological constants in a toy model of a landscape due to Arkani, Hamed, Demopolis, and Katru. Their basic model is the following. Um, we want to take some scalar potential for some scalar fields. That's just a sum i goes from 1 to n of v of phi i, where each component looks like this. So this is the picture for v of phi i. There's some maximum v of i plus, and there's some minimum v of i minus. And the potential that they take is this decoupled scalar potential that just sums up over these different components. Maximum. You didn't yeah. mean maximum. Relative maximum. Rel sorry, relative maximum. Yes. Yes. For this component, this is the the this is the relative maximum. That's right. Re relative minimum. Relative. And and relative minimum. It's a minimum. It's a higher it's minimum. minimum. Local minimum. Local minimum. Local minimum. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. Yes. Thank you. There is also a maximum. There's a maximum. <laughs> oh yes, 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 yes. Thank you. Yes, they're both local minima. Yes, very good. My, my brain is so much in NP land that I'm forgetting basic. Yes, there's two. There's, turns out there's two local minima here, and this one is higher than this one. Yes, very good. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to. This, is, this model has two. This model has two. OK, so the point is in this, in this model, as I uh, remember basic things, uh, is that there's two to the n vacua in this model. It's a toy model, but it's a model where there's two to the n vacua. Um, in, this, in this toy model, uh, the cosmological constant is written as lambda m uh, which you can rewrite as, in terms of the difference, the delta vi's between each of these guys, plus some overall minimum, right? Where m takes values in z each mi takes values in zero one according to which minimum you choose for each scalar, right? Okay. So this is the uh, this is the your minima, local minima, you denote it by vi minus vi plus. That's what you say that this individual potentials are i dependent? They're i dependent? Well, is it the same function for all? Is it the same function for all? Oh, it can, it can be a different function. They're just, they, they're. Yes, thank you. Yes, good. Good, good, good. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's what you want. Yeah. yeah, very good. Thank you. That's right. It's different, it's different functions. I'm, I'm, I'm being a little too quick. Yeah, good. Uh, no, there's, there's a different potential function for each scalar, and then it's summing over different decoupled scalars. So there's i, there's i scale. Yeah, sorry, I'm not. I have n scalars. I have n scalars. There's a potential that vi for each scalar, which is vi of phi i. I have uh, I demand two minima for each. This is this is their model, and uh, and then you want to ask about what the CC is in the full set of two to the n vacua. Yeah. Yeah. So this this is a model with decoupled scalars. Okay, and um, okay. very good. So. Now with this, this does not arise in any more physics. no, no, that's right. It's a toy model for sure, for sure. Yes, uh, some people have recently been working on the question of whether such uh, de Sitter minima actually exist. So, uh, yeah, 
Uh, that's right. This is not known in any known physics. It's a toy model. Um, Bussel Pachinsky was the other model they studied. We'll get there in a second. Um, but and and in the Douglas the Neff paper, they talk about ways in which the Bussel Pachinsky model in a more complete string story would be changed. And yeah, I, I, I refer you to that. They talk about a toy version of Bussel Pachinsky. Yeah. Right. So um, cool. So th this is the setup, and then you can ask. You can define a complexity question related to the cosmological constant here. I will call it, this is not my definition, this is, this is uh, in the original papers, but I, I'm, I'm calling it ADKCC for simplicity. It's a map from the set of delta VIs, V mins, lambda zero, and epsilon, to the question, does there exist M such that the cosmological constant lies in some range lambda zero Lambda zero plus epsilon. Okay. So that's the question. Uh, this is the physically natural question that arises in this toy model, and uh, yeah, in this toy field theory model. And the question is: Is there is there some complexity problem that's related to it that allows you to determine the complexity of this question? And there's a famous problem called the knapsack problem. And the knapsack problem is given. Given some costs, ci, some values, vi, some maximum cost that you're willing to pay, and some minimum value that you want to achieve, the question is, does there exist m in 0, 1 to the n such that the sum of the costs is less than the maximum cost, and the sum of the values is greater than the minimum value. This is a very natural, simple problem. You might have thought about going hiking, wanting to have a finite size knapsack, and different items you might place in it have different values to you. They also have different sizes and weights, and you're trying to maximize the greatness of the things in your backpack, given the fact that they have different weights and costs. Um, this is uh, a famous problem. You can map this onto many, many, many different settings. Uh, in, in industry, for example, uh, things like this arise. And uh, the basic theorem, uh, of course, I think this one's due to CARP also, but I'm not sure, is that knapsack is NP-complete. So one of the things that's kind of funny is that these problems that sound so unbelievably simple are, are problems for which if p is not equal to np, there is no exponent, there is no polynomial time solution algorithm for them. Uh, another one is something called subset sum. Given a set of n integers, is there a subset that sums to zero or not? This is something that is also difficult. You might imagine in the context of string theory that because these are such simple problems that when they get more and more complicated in string theory that you're going to run into even more difficult issues. And uh, what Douglas and Deneff showed, this is the key point, uh, uh, is that Arkani Hamed Demopoulos Kachu CC problem is NP complete. And the way that they did it, again, showing NP in this case is easy. The, th the thing that, well, it's all, it's all pretty easy actually, is that knapsack reduces to ADKCC. And in particular, they wrote down explicit, an explicit map from sort of the parameters of the ADKCC model to, uh, to, 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 to knapsack. Sorry, sorry, uh, the other way around. Of, of a general knapsack to a specific ADKCC model. Yeah, it's okay. Since we've seen several problems in class M, can you give a problem which looks complicated but actually is in class P? Yeah. Um, uh, I'm forgetting the exact problem statement. Uh, yeah, I, I, I believe the complicated one that is in class P is known as primes. This is a proof, this, this millennium, that primes is in P. Primes, I believe, I, I think I'm remember, judging by the title, it's the question, given an integer, is it a prime number or not? Uh, that problem there is a polynomial time algorithm for, and that is a commonly cited example of a problem that sounds very hard, but actually is P. Um, I hope I got that right, but there's this. Uh, 
Yeah, I think it's got to be in the number of digits, the size of the input, which in this case, the size of the input is the number of digits. When you think about putting a very, very, very large uh, uh, integer on a computer and asking whether or not it is prime, uh, then, um, yeah, the, 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 the precision of the integer, the number of digits in it is the size of the input. This reminds me of the great story of the maple prime. Do you ever, have you ever heard that story? That sounds in the interesting, no. versions of maple, oh. there was a uh, probabilistic primality test. Uh -huh. And you could, uh, there was this great example, of which I've forgotten, and you put is prime for n um, a times b, where a and b were specific integers, and the answer was true. <laughs> <laughs> the maple prime. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. They, they were even rarer than the primes. They were rarer than the primes. I was hard to find it. So, <laughs> let me make just a few obvious comments about this problem. Uh, obviously, as n grows, brute force, you, you, could, you could just go through all the vacua, right? Goes like that algorithm for checking, uh, solving this problem, grows like 2 to the n. Uh, for n is 50, assuming uh, 10 to the 9 examples per second, that would take two weeks. But for n is 400, kind of typical number of scalar fields in a Calabria moduli space, uh, n is 10 to the 104 years. So exponential time algorithms can be really painful. Uh, one of the things. What's the assumption that exactly two minimum for a scalar count from? Uh, it's an assumption of the model. Okay. It's it's an assumption of the model. They, yeah. Yeah. That's right. It's an assumption of the model. So. To put it into this kind of. Yeah. Ex well, they did right. They didn't put it in this context. They they proposed it for a simple toy model of a field theory landscape, and it was Douglas and Deneff that put it in the context of complexity. Yeah. So. Uh, Right. Uh, to advertise the paper by Bao and Busso and company from last year, uh, they teamed up with uh, some computer scientists who were familiar with algorithms for efficiently solving knapsack, and they were to actually make some progress on this, despite the fact that it's NP-complete. So this is one of the tensions that you run into. Just because something doesn't have a polynomial time solution algorithm doesn't necessarily mean that the algorithm is totally intractable, because for the problem that you actually care about, there's some fixed input size, typically, or some range of input sizes, and you might be able to get by. And that's what they studied. And finally, the last thing before the break is uh, Busel Pachinsky. It would be a subset of I where you have a polynomial solution. And just that's right. You just don't have it for all right. This, this is, this, uh, so, sorry, there could, be, there could be a subset of these for which there could, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, so, so Domenico is raising a good point that in all of these cases, you're mapping, you, given some instance of, there's the general problem, which I've sort of stated here, but then specifying an instance is sort of specifying exactly what the, you know, the, what the details of the instance are. And some instances may have polynomial time algorithms, even though uh, the general problem doesn't. And we'll get to an example of that in the next section. So the general, for ex I'll mention this at the end too, the general protein folding problem is NP-complete, but actually proteins fold quite fast in nature, and it's because the types of proteins that actually exist in nature are, are proteins for which there is a fast folding algorithm. So how about weak, weak complexity <laughs> conjecture? If the problem is, is, is too complex, it's unphysical? Uh, uh, that is, right, so... <laughs> So, so, so that is an interesting question. Uh, that is the spirit of the Douglas and F paper from last year, uh, to relate uh, the complexity of a problem to what it causes us to think or not think about physical systems, which is uh, sort of some comments that I'll make at the very end of the next part of the talk. But that's sort of exactly the question. So if, if uh, right, so in the context of protein folding, uh, there are many little local minima, and there's a global minimum. And uh, you can reach the global minimum because the, the proteins that exist in nature fold easily. But there are other problems for which there's a very, very slow relaxation to the global minimum, but you never actually sort of reach it. And reaching the global minimum would be NP-complete. So this is sort of the question that one wants to ask. How does complexity theory map onto physics and what we expect for the dynamics of physical systems? And in the protein case, presumably evolutionarily, it had to. Uh, yeah, and I, I, I have uh, sort of three mechanisms and some comments on that at the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess Martin's getting at the idea, how might it be that there is this efficient algorithm and it may be evolutionarily that protein folding is efficient because evolution selected the efficient algorithm. Yeah, um, all right. So uh, finally, Busel Pachinsky. This was the main focus of the Douglas Deneff paper. 
They talk about all of the caveats with the toy model, uh, which I refer you to their paper for that. That is not the point. And this is what we're actually studying with reinforcement learning recently. Uh, this is the problem. n is a vector in z to the k. Yeah. Gij is some positive definite metric. Lambda 0 is some bare cc. The definition of busel pachinsky cosmological constant is uh, given an instance which requires specifying a metric, a lambda 0, a lambda 1, and a lambda 2. Uh, does there exist an n such that lambda 1 is less than or equal to lambda is less than or equal to lambda 2? Question mark. And their theorem, Douglas and Deneff, they used, yeah, they reduced uh, the subset pro sum problem that I just mentioned. Is there a subset of a fixed set of integers that sums to 0 to a, a, a promised version of the subset sum that they then reduced to busel pachinsky And that, uh, together with showing that it's NP, shows that busel pachinsky cosmological constant is in NP complete. And uh, right. Right, so that was the, the, the uh, and the paper is really exploring different caveats and possibilities and uh, 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 corrections away from the toy model about what this might mean, how to think about it, etc. Uh, I won't talk much about their paper in the next section, but these two examples were sort of the focus of this first paper on computational complexity in the landscape, and uh, I encourage you to read it. So uh, this is a good time to stop, and I'll talk about the new stuff in a few minutes. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming back. Uh, I'm going to pass on to the second part of my talk now, where I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, similar context, but I'm not going to be doing review like I did for that first full 45 minutes. Uh, thank you for uh, listening through that review. Hopefully, it was useful for some of you. Uh, so what I'm going to tell you about now is Vacua and near vacua. This is work with uh, Fabian Rulle, who is a postdoc at Oxford that is, uh, the umlaut doesn't go there if I put the E in. He's a postdoc at Oxford that is uh, going to CERN. Uh, our fourth and uh, fifth paper are coming out this month, uh, and I'm really lucky to have him as a, a collaborator. It's maybe my most uh, uh, diverse collaboration. I mean, we've worked on n equals two deformations of n equals two SCFTs, two dark matter papers. Uh, now we're trying to apply artificial intelligence to to the landscape in terms of little uh, robots that can explore the landscape and learn to do it more and more intelligently over time. And and now we're we're tackling complex uh, complexity of vacua. And uh, I'm just really lucky to have him as a collaborator. He's he's wonderful. So uh, there are a few questions that. Uh, so, so we got talking about this about, uh, about a month ago, and there were a lot of questions that we, we, we found interesting. Uh, one of them was, when people do moduli stabilization, uh, there's sort of an intuitive answer. Why is it that most of the examples are kind of at small values of the Calabia moduli? You're not sort of way out in the bulk of the Hodge diamond. And it seems natural to think that compl computational complexity might be part of the reason, uh, and, and we're going to try to put some teeth on that. I'm not actually going to do any detailed string constructions here, which is why I don't have as much to say about the sitter as, as I would like. But uh, I, I still think this is uh, a, a useful thing to think about. So there's two basic problems. Given a scalar potential, uh, do there exist complexity issues related to vacua and near vacua? And I'll define a problem that I'll call stable vacuum. a problem called metastable vacuum. And a problem called near vacua. Uh, I won't actually formally define a problem for that. It'll just be sort of obvious what the takeaway is. Something that I don't think I'm going to have time to get to, and this is what in string theory we think about, if you want to determine v of phi in string theory, do you run into complexity issues there also? 
So if one were to think about sort of the general problem of, of studying vacua in a scalar potential on a large dimensional scalar field space, uh, if you were given V of phi, you can ask, do I have complexity issues with finding vacua there? But then you can ask the other question, which is what a lot of people that work on string compactifications are asking. Can I determine all of the corrections to V of phi that I need to to be sure that I can trust my effective field theory description? Uh, this, there's already s some previous work on that from, from, from 2006 and 2010 about, about complexity there a little bit. We're going to say some more, but this is sort of how I think about it. In string theory, to even tackle this problem, you first have to tackle this problem. And what we think is going to be coming out of this is sort of a nested set of complexity problems where this is going to be complex generally, and this is also going to be complex. And so there's a very difficult problem, in a sense, that we're up against in string theory. But because this is, in some sense, general, given some scalar potential that, uh, that you are to trust, can you actually do what you want to do? OK. So that's the question. So I'll define stable vacuum. Uh, maybe I'll just call it SVAC for simplicity. SVAC is the problem given a scalar potential, some real numbers Li and Ui, minimize V of phi such that uh, Li is less than or equal to phi i is less than or equal to Ui. I'm putting my scalar field space in a box. And I want to minimize the scalar potential on this space. And an instance of the problem would require specifying these, these things. And there's decision problem versions, too, where instead of talking about a minimization problem, an optimization problem, you can, you can recast this in the language of a yes-no question. So uh, the question, then, that you want to ask for this problem, does there exist some problem that's NP-hard such that F reduces to stable vacuum. Remember from the last session that uh, if you reduce one NP-hard problem to, to, to uh, this problem here, you will, in essence, show the NP-hardness of this problem. And the reason that NP-hard is meaningful is that if P is not equal to NP, it means that there is no polynomial time solution algorithm. If you have an NP-hard problem, pardon? Uh, right, so hard, uh, complete is NP intersect hard. So from the point of view of polynomial time versus exponential algorithms, it's really the hardness that is the important thing. Some of the problems will also be complete. They'll have the extra intersect NP part. Yeah. Oh, this is the question. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, the general problem, sorry, the, the, gener the general problem, I believe, is difficult to show. So a problem that I'm going to show in a minute that's related to stable vacuum was shown to be NP-hard in the 70s and was shown to be NP in the early 90s. So uh, I don't know the answer there uh, to stable vacuum. But this is the question we want to ask about I'm stable sorry, vacuum. It's not NP. I mean, if you have the phi and you're given some phi. Yeah, so that's a very good question. So what I was wondering this too. In the problem that I'll get to in a second, uh, the, the, the question was, given, uh, given the candidate minimum, you want to ask, is there a way to truncate it to a precision level that is acceptable in polynomial time in the inputs? So given a candidate x star, it may be some real number with you know, a, a, an irrational number with an infinite number of digits, an infinite number of precision. Can you actually put that thing on a computer? So this is where the subtlety lies. Uh, this actually evaluating it is pretty simple. The subtlety about NP-ness comes in verifying that given a candidate solution, there's a nearby solution that is polynomial in the, that is polynomial size in a sense. It's, it's a subtlety. Um, right. If it were just that, it would be easy and automatic. But there's this subtlety that is explained in this Vivasis book that I mentioned earlier. So, but, but, but again, the, the key thing from, from our point of view is, is sort of the hardness, not the NP-ness. Yeah. All right. By the way, it's pronounced Vivasis. Oh, ah, Vivasis. My apologies to Professor Vivasis if he ever watches this. Thank you. I will never make that mistake again. And also, uh, I have one of you <laughs> huh? I didn't have one. He was a freshman in college. Really? Okay. Well, there you go. Uh, 
All right, vivacious. And uh, while I'm at it, I, uh, so apparently Ramsey is intricately, intricately connected in a lot of this story, and I just don't know it yet because I'm not a computer scientist. So thanks to Martin for telling me about some of that during the break. Uh, all right. Sorry, uh, maybe what I should say is that if I were a computer scientist, I would be more familiar with the combinatorists that are relevant for computer science. <laughs> All right, enough apologies. Uh, yeah, so, um, okay, so this is the question. And what I need to do is talk about a particularly very, very well studied class of problems called quadratic programming. QP. This is quadratic programming. Programming. Okay. So given, it'll become clear what these symbols are in a second, H, C, A, B, the question is to minimize 1 half x transpose H, x plus C, T, x, such that A, x is greater than or equal to B, and x lives in R, n. Okay. So this is the quadratic programming problem. Uh, yeah, so A is a matrix acting on the vector. It means that every entry is greater than or equal to. So this is a vector on the left-hand side. This is a vector on the right-hand side. It means greater than or equal to for every single entry. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. OK. Uh, the theorem, and uh, as I was mentioning, so uh, this is the NP hardness is due to Sani, and the NP-ness is due to the basis. Yeah, look at that. Uh, and the theorem is that QP is NP-complete. OK? OK? So that's this uh, nice, simple theorem. It tells you that given an ar sort, of a, sort of somewhat arbitrary quadratic function subject to some linear constraints, if you want to find the global minimum of that thing, it's very hard. And if P is not equal to NP, there is no polynomial time algorithm that does it. Uh, there's a couple of subcases, though, and this is related to something that was raised. If you have a hard problem, but then you go to subcases, might some of the subcases actually be much more easy than the general case? Uh, there's a problem called convex QP. Uh, which is QP with H positive definite. And this problem is in P. So if you go to the subclass of the quadratic programming problems where H is positive definite, you have some sort of potential that sort of funnels downwards and there's one global minimum, uh, then, then it's actually in P. And there are polynomial time algorithms that solve convex QP in various applications. That's what you want to do. But on the other hand, <clears throat> there's two other problems I want to mention, both of which are relevant for our work, called simplex QP and uh, box QP. Box QP is uh, QP with X in the simplex. Which is positive XIs that sum up to 1 with XI greater than or equal to 0. Okay. And uh, then also, box QP is this problem. Uh, Li, the constraints instead are of this form, Li less than or equal to Xi less than or equal to Ui. Yeah. And uh, this guy's P, but both of these guys are actually NP complete. Okay? So sometimes you go to a subcase and you can show that it's in P, but other subcases are still NP complete, even if you restrict to that subcase. Okay? Now you can sort of see where I'm going. Actually, this is a fine place to write it. This is just simple inclusion. I'll put the theorem in quotes, because really what we're doing is importing a result from the complexity literature and applying it to something that we care about in a pretty straightforward way. Uh, so box QP uh, reduces to stable vacuum, and therefore stable vacuum is NP-hard. 
Uh, I, 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 well, for the same reason that some mathematicians might not like to call lemmas theorems, that it's, it, uh, we're, we're, we're proud of this result, but we actually didn't have to do that much to get it. We just had to know about this result and know that we can reduce it to the problem that we care about. I'll erase the quotes. Uh, we, can, we can reduce it to the problem that we care about basically via inclusion. So, so the scale, when you do this reduction, the scalar potential that you use, you just replace the quadratic programming problem. Phi, the x vector becomes the field. H becomes some, some matrix that is tying together the fields in a quadratic way. And CT becomes this. So, yeah. Yes? Sorry, so from what you say, it appears that the difficulty lies uh, not in the inter integrality of flux choices, but actually in the minimization of the potential. So I am, e right, so integrality of flux choices is something that we know about from string theory. Right. To determine the way that I set it up here, the, the sort of the, the full problem, if you'd like, in string theory is first to determine the scalar potential, and that can be quite hard, as we know. And then given that scalar potential, to then try to minimize it, right? So I'm saying that even the top part is already hard. And, yeah. But my question was, so my, my confusion is, in the case specifically Zuzi and uh, <coughs> Yes. Uh, that is right because positive definiteness. You're re you're restricted to a subclass of potentials where positive definiteness and certain types of minima make the problem much easier. That's right. So so there are sub cases where life can become easier, but the general problem is hard. This is kind of not the uh, search for Zuzi minima, but this is a search for non-Zuzi minima in a complex structure landscape. Uh, I wouldn't even say complex structure landscape because all I talked about is V of phi. I'm really just doing effective field theory. But if you want to put it in that context. I, I, I want to think of the only example where I know where this yeah, yeah. really arises. So, 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 in some sense, you can say for the Vs of phi's that we actually get in string theory, the ones that we can control, uh, are, there, are there special minima for which it's actually very easy to solve? And the answer to that is probably yes, but asking that in a complete, and for Susie, I think it is yes. Uh, Asking that problem in complete generality, what is the full space of scalar potentials you get from string theory, is of course something we'd all like to know, but, but we don't. So I've sort of cast it in this very broad perspective, and, and in some sense, one good thing for future work is to better understand the scalar potentials we can get from string theory and whether it helps solve this complexity issue. Yeah. yeah. Curiosity. What about if you change the convex to semi-convex? I don't know. I'm pretty sure that's known, but I don't know the answer. I would, I would actually think that it would still be in P. Uh, you just mean so that H is positive semi-definite. Right. Yeah. I, I, I don't, right. I, I think it's when you have negative eigenvalues of H that you really run into issues. Yeah. So you can verify S back faster than you can solve it? Ah, I did not say that I can verify S back. I said it's NP hard. Oh, maybe not. I didn't say that it's NP necessarily. Right. And this is one of the things that I don't fully understand. Uh, Sani, th this means NP hard and NP. Sani did NP hard in like 74. This proof of NP for this problem is in 91 or 90 or something like that. So, yeah. Okay, so, all right, but, but uh, if this was all that we had, we wouldn't be necessarily telling you about it because it's sort of intuitive. This is telling you that global minima are difficult to find, right? I'm not, I didn't say metastable vacuum, I said stable vacuum. This is really the global minimum. And it is, once you start reading about complexity and you learn about quadratic programming, it's sort of the obvious thing that quadratic programming, finding the global minimum, is difficult. Uh, in a sense, there, there are certain physical systems, uh, Douglas and Deneff uh, talk about a number of them. Some, some of them are trying to find the global minimum, but when you actually study the dynamics, it's sort of a long, slow movement towards the global minimum because the global minimum is hard to find. But this is, this is the problem of the global minimum. And that is not the main thing we want to focus on. So you're not focusing on it because of inadequate tools rather than lack of interest. Uh, I, I think physically it's not the main. OK, good. If, knowing the absolute ground state of string theory is something we would love to know. Uh, but in some sense, when we talk about the landscape, we're often discussing in the context of metastable minima that are local minima that are global minima. So that's the context in which I want to sort of cast a wider net. Um, yeah. Yep. So, uh, and um, NP hardness of, I mean, this result is sort of intuitive. The, the next result from the literature is what really surprised me. Okay. 
definition. Uh, yeah, I'll call it MVAC. Thank you. I wrote it out in my notes, but writing metastable vacuum over and over again is a pain. OK, so given V, same input, Li, Ui, sorry, and also a candidate local minimum that I'll call phi star, not complex conjugate. It's just star. It's labeling a special candidate point. Uh, is phi star in Rn a local minimum, i.e., is Li less than or equal to phi, this special point, Yes, a local minimum for the potential in the box. So this is the, the box constraint right here. That's right. Uh, this is one. And the second thing you want to ask, does there exist an epsilon such that v of phi is greater than or equal to v of phi star for all phi such that phi minus phi star is less than or equal to epsilon? So that there's some little local neighborhood where this really is the minimum value, where V of phi really is the, the minimum value. And so then the question again, um, does there exist F that's NP hard uh, that, reduces, that reduces F to MS vac? Okay. And for this, I need to define I'm going to leave that up there, because that's sort of the overall story, the questions we want to ask. I'm going to define another problem. So we just did global QP, finding the global minimum of a quadratic programming problem. There is a problem that was studied uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. It is called QP loc. And QP loc is the problem given the quadratic I programming input data and a candidate local minimum x star is a x star greater than or equal to b and does there exist epsilon such that one half x t h x plus c t x is greater than or equal to one half x star t h x star plus c t x star for all x for all x such that x minus x star is less than or equal to epsilon. So this is QP loc. Uh, there's a theorem. This is, uh, Dave, feel free to correct my pronunciation if you know these people too, Murti and Kabati from 1987. Not okay. <laughs> QP loc is co-NP hard. And I'll say what co means in a minute. Uh, there's two other proofs, one a little later due to Partalos and Schnitger, and another due to Vivesis that is in his book. Uh, this is one of those unusual cases where you try to go read this paper, and at least with two data points of Northeastern University and uh, Oxford University, it is behind a paywall that we cannot get behind. So we, we, uh, we are using the other proof, but the original proof is due to Murti and Kabedi. So, Sci-Hub? I'm learning all sorts of things today. Uh, OK, yeah. I should look that up. That's great. Thank you. Uh, the normal sort of pathways through the journals itself were blocked. So uh, yeah. have rips things off. Ah, I would never use such a thing. I'm on video, guys. Come on. No. <laughs> Come on. Uh, all right, very good. So uh, very good, very good. So this is the theorem. Uh, I will put this problem up here and give a little sketch of the proof, and then relate it to the problem that we care about. Uh, yeah. Um, basically, co-NP, yeah. 
A problem is in NP if you can, in polynomial time, say that the yes answers are in fact yes. The proposed yes answer is in fact yes. And if you want to do the same thing for no, that's what co-NP is. So it's sort of the difference between yes and no. <laughs> um, yeah, right. Um, yes, but having having a polynomial time algorithm that verifies yes instances versus verifying no instances, you're, you're, you're saying that you're an NP says that you have a polynomial time algorithm so that verifies it. it. Yeah, right. So, so, so if your answer to your problem is yes or no, and given a candidate, you. NP means that the yeses you can verify in polynomial time. Co-NP means the noes that you can, verif can, you can verify in polynomial time. And things that are in NP intersect co-NP are things that you can verify yes and no, both in polynomial time. So uh, right, there is a symmetry between flipping this yes and no, but the question is which one you have the polynomial time algorithm for. It's, it's a little bit of, it's a subtlety. It's a subtlety. It's the same sort of thing that has anything to do with details. How accurate your numbers are and things. Uh, right. So, so the general definition is just whether or not you can verify a yes instance in polynomial time or a no instance in polynomial time. NP or co-NP. What that means in a given problem. Uh, uh, the reason they're not obviously the same. That's right. They're, they're not obviously the same. Right. They're not. They're not, they're not obviously the same. Cool. It's an open question. Well, depends. I, mean, I think there's not abstract way of saying it. Yeah, I, I don't. I think you cannot say abstract. Any question you have, you can put the knot on it. Yeah. Flips them. So that's right. For a given question, you've got to distinguish them. That's right. That's right. NP means that you can answer about yes or no. NP means you can answer about yes. yes. It means you can check yeses quickly. Co NP means you can so check NP nos quickly. It's amorphic, depending on which question you ask. Right. But the but the question is which one you have the polynomial time algorithm to check it quickly. What is the output of the algorithm? Oh, uh, either yes or I don't know. No, it's yes. It's yes or no. It's just a question, of, right? It's okay, it's and so, but the running time is longer for no. Is that what you're saying? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly what I'm saying. It could be the case that if you have a polynomial time algorithm that, given an input, uh, if the answer is yes, it is possible that it. Sorry, it, it will check in polynomial time for NP, but it may be that you give it something. And it just seems to go forever. And it may be exponential, but if it, if it doesn't actually halt in some finite time on your computer, you don't really know whether it was a yes instance that was working in polynomial time, but you just didn't reach the end of the process yet, or if it's a no instance and it's really just living in exponential space. I guess in, in this case, yeah. the asymmetry is sort of obvious, right? Because you're, you're asking to satisfy an inequality to all x's in a certain area. Near uh, you'll see the knot come in in just a second. You'll see where this comes in in a critical spot in just a second. Um, yeah. I'm oh, good. <laughs> uh, right. Proof All right. So, right. So, this is where I was. Um. Yes, but I, I, I'll, make, I'll, make, I'll make a concrete statement. There's a couple of different proofs, and they do slightly different things. And I should say that... And one of them you haven't seen. Huh? One, two of them I actually haven't seen. Uh, the early literature actually says that it's NP-hard, but some more recent stuff corrects it uh, and just puts a co on it, which is, seems like a... It's, it's the sort of subtlety that might be caught. I, I, don't, I, I don't know why it was caught later, but it, it seems to be that it really is co, as the more recent literature says. OK, so the proof sketch is just the following. There's something called, called the Motzkin-Strauss theorem. And Motzkin-Strauss says that uh, to any graph G, there exists a quadratic function, a special quadratic function, f of x, which is equal to minus sum xi xj, where i and j, uh, i and j are nodes that make up edges of g. So given any graph g, you can study its space of edges and form this quadratic function. And the thing that they showed is that this, this particular function is, uh, is related 
the minimum of it is related to click size. So there's some clicks in this graph, potentially. Remember that I told you that this click problem is very difficult. There is a special quadratic function that you can associate to any graph such that uh, the minimum of it is related to the click size. So this is how they start moving from a graph problem to a quadratic programming problem. Uh, and in particular, what this leads to is a particular g-dependent QP-loc instance. And there's three different proofs, but uh, I'll what Vivasis shows, none of the others re rely on such a special point, I don't think. Uh, sorry. The later literature comments that none of the others. <laughs> I have not seen it myself. But x star is a local min. x star is 0 is a local min of that QP loc if and only if g does not have a click of size k. Not have a click of size k. Okay. So uh, a few comments. Uh, one is that first. Uh, I forgot to say that the input is g and k. The input of the problem is an undirected graph g. Uh, k is, no, I'm sorry, k is, the, k is the maximum click size. What are the x's? No, k, is, k is an input. X are, x are formal variables that you associate to every node. So, 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 th right. so this is what Moskin, Moskin and Strauss did. They wanted to know, is there a special function whose minimum is related to the click size? And they introduced variables, one for every node. Yeah. Yes, sir. <coughs> so, uh, OK, very good. So let me get to the main uh, sort of punchline here. OK, so it's co-NP hard. The co-ness is this not right here. What this is saying is that determining this local minimum is basically equivalent to determining when you don't have a click of size at least k. Um, k is an input uh, of, of this particular graph. And, uh, right? and uh, this is uh, the complement of an NP-hard problem, which makes it co-NP-hard. And that is why QP-loc is co-NP-hard and not NP-hard. The key thing, though, is that from the point of view of uh, what, what we care about, if you were to find a polynomial time solution algorithm for an NP hard problem, you would be proving that P is equal to co NP and P is also equal to NP. Um, so therefore, because we believe that P is not equal to NP, we expect an exponential time algorithm for this. So that, that's, the, that's the punchline of, of, of what we mean here. And, um, So, so, so the, the, the co is a, an important technical thing, but uh, as, as we believe that it, it does not change the basic fundamental story that this is a problem for which there is no polynomial time solution algorithm if p is not equal to np. Okay? <laughs> so. Okay, and I'm going to box qp loc is just qp loc with box constraints. Uh, what by understanding the Vivasis proof, you, we were able to understand that you can just modify box QP loc directly and show that uh, box QP loc is NP hard. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Co NP hard. And, uh, and then finally, for the same reason, uh, box QP loc can be reduced to metastable vacua, and therefore metastable vacua is co NP hard. Okay. Right. And uh, very good. So, in the interest of time, I'm definitely not going to get to this place. But I have to tell you about this, near vacua, what I mean, and then we'll summarize all three of these results and make some comments. But uh, stable vacuum is NP-hard. Metastable vacuum is co-NP-hard. 
And now we want to talk about near vacua. So that's QP loc. Okay. Modify minus table vector to instead of looking at a region around it, you just look at the derivatives, the eigenvalues. Uh, uh, just looking at the derivatives, right? So, so looking, um, looking not for minima, but for for critical points. Period. No, no. The oh no, sorry. For the, you said the Hessian. Sorry. That's a much easier problem because you don't have to check all the values around it. <coughs> That seems, that seems simpler. Uh, but that will not give you the same vacuum. But each of my sex, each of my spot, is Hessian in the There's no real no point to it. Yeah, so mate, I don't. No, I, if you add a critical point, oh, you're you're adding adding point. point. So finding a critical point and then checking it out. Yeah, point with me on the boundary of the box. That's true. Okay. Yeah. But again, that seems like a discrete thing to check, so that doesn't seem so. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not sure. I, have, I haven't thought much about about the Hessian directly. Um, that, that sound, that, then that sounds more like the, you know, the positive yeah. problem you have in, in, for the quadratic. See. Right. So, so QP loc, the positive QP loc problem is co NP hard. Um, we're mapping it on to this click problem, the knot of the click problem. No, no, the QP hard problem, you know, with the positive age. Ah, that's what you mean. I'm sorry. Yes, yes, yes. That one was, that was, one was P. Oh, so you mean, you mean, uh, you, you mean positive, I'm sorry, you mean positive definite QP loc. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, in that, in that case, I think it'll simplify again. So there, right, right. there's, that, that's, in many cases, that's a, Practical way of looking for metastable vectors. If if you have such an H, then yes, I think so. Yeah. Now, this isn't the global H; it is the local H, right? It's the Hessian <coughs> H locally in the vicinity of the. Uh, yes. No, I understand. Isn't computing those derivatives just as hard as checking all the points near the point? No. If the function isn't given by an analytic expression, it's just some smooth function on yeah. a computer. I don't think so because I mean it, it's you know whatever dimension space you're in it's just a, a finite number of uh, it's a matrix finite dimensional matrix. B is just a smooth function. But Hessian is just how do you compute Hessian? I'm saying. I don't think you have to look in all possible directions. You 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 have just uh, just the dimensions of your of your phi space. Yeah, I haven't thought about I haven't thought about this I haven't thought about from this particular view. I'm yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and finish up. Yeah, it's an interesting question, Martin. Uh, yeah. So a function from u to r with dim u is n will say that x star uh, in u is an x epsilon approximate, I'll just call it an, an epsilon minimum. The full, the full name is an epsilon approximate local minimum. Uh, there exists an n in u such that x star in n and f x star less than or equal to x minus x star for all x in n intersect u. Okay? So, um, right, right. Uh, right. I want to work with if of whether it exists. Yes, thank you. I knew that something felt wrong. I, I knew that something felt wrong. <laughs> yeah, so if there exists, uh, right. The question is whether or not this is close to a minimum or not. It is true that this definition could 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 apply uh, to saddles or local maxes, but really we're, we're going to be focusing on local minima. Um, and, and Vivesis has comments on caveats about this. But the theorem that he has 
is that uh, if f is c prime and the gradients, the, the c prime is c1. C, sorry, c1. Thank you. Precision less than or equal to m x minus y. So f of x, the absolute value of f of x minus f of y is less than or equal to m times the distance. An epsilon, an epsilon minimum can be found uh, with at most 4n m over epsilon squared function and gradient evaluations. So, so saying, no, it's it's an input. It's 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 said to uh, for every epsilon. You choose an epsilon. It's input. Uh, yeah. Given epsilon. Yeah. Right. So that's very p. Yeah, it's very p. It's it's not it's not just p. It's 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 l. It's linear. <laughs> Um, well, sorry, it's linear in n. So here are, here are the couple of, 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 of caveats. OK, I'll just comment on the physics rather than, than talk about it. This, this theorem is nice because it's telling you if you want to find a near minimum, you can do it linear in linear time in the number of the scalar fields. Uh, M is, is uh, right, so if you divide through, you realize that this is sort of, this is bounding the gradient. Uh, and it, this is bounding the gradient in a sense. Uh, and, uh, right. And in particular, in the limit that epsilon goes to zero, in which case the epsilon minima would become local minima, uh, this, this, the time that this algorithm would take diverges. So if that wasn't the case, this would be at odds with the co-NP-hard theorem that I just quoted. So this is telling you that if you sort of want to, morally, if you want to get epsilon close to a local minimum, you can do it in linear time, but the algorithm that the Vivasis gives will diverge as epsilon goes to zero. Um, so if you'd like, uh, the, the thing to say here is that near vacua are easy to find, and in particular, it's linear in the number of scalar fields. Whereas the co-NP hard result tells you that uh, find, finding, finding local minima is exponential in the number of scalar fields. No, that yep. would be more interesting if there is quadratic P1 over epsilon. Uh, yes, that's, that, yeah, that's true. Um, right, so, so what the linear problem is, is to find at least one epsilon minima rather than to find all epsilon minima. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay. to find one epsilon minimum. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let me give you some summary and comments and, and then end the talk. Uh, yeah, this is the thing to erase. Maybe I can do it in that little corner. You have a whole blank unmovable board, but you're taking your time. I do. All right, fine. Yeah, this one? I don't want to use the unmovable boards, sure but I, I am, aren't I? So summary and comments. So just reminding you of these results. Metastable, uh, sorry, stable vac is NP hard. Metastable vac is co NP hard? Near vac, which I didn't formally define, but you get the idea. You want to find something that's close to a minimum, is in P. And uh, right, sorry, this is subscript one, two, three. And then point two, this is, these are the results. This is the summary of the results. Uh, P is not equal to NP implies finding vacua is exponential time. And, uh, right. Uh, on the other hand, near vacua is linear, as you might expect. So, uh, sorry, you might expect that it's easy, not necessarily linear. But, uh, OK, so I. I huh? Grosch is essentially linear. It's bounded by. But. You need that 
<laughs> no, the condition over here. But that basically says that it has a Taylor inspection. Uh, yes. <sighs> yes. Yeah. I don't think it has so to be the condition is in A in this mode set. It's in uh, linear in N. Yes, that's right. This right. This condition is linear in N. It's a general. Otherwise, it's a general C1 function. Basically, tells you how far you are, right? How big the gradients are, so how far you are from. Okay. So there's there's practical issues. One is lots of times we face places where our computers choke. Uh, and we run into a hard problem. One of them in string theory is that even determining VFI is difficult, and I think that's computationally complex, even though I didn't get to it at all. One reason to think that is because determining instanton corrections is extremely important, and instanton problems are related to lattice problems, which are, no which are notoriously difficult. For example, the leading instanton correction at a given point in the Kähler cone uh, would be equivalent to solving what's called the shortest vector problem, and the shortest vector problem is NP-complete. Okay. Uh, but if you, the, the, thing, the reason why I focus on this other thing is that uh, given V of phi, it seems you already uh, have interesting, a trustable V of phi, you already have some interesting complexity story here. And then I want to, uh, you can ask whether this has cosmological implications. Question mark, I'll give two question marks because I, I don't know, know necessarily what we're supposed to take out of it. But naively, you might expect rolling, right? Because, uh, sorry, and I should say, cosmology in a context where uh, you imagine that it's easier for cosmology to do things that are less computationally complex than things that are computationally complex. This is part of the Douglas Deneff proposal of last year. Uh, the basic idea is, is that physics that governs the dynamics of the universe is an algorithm. And if there is no polynomial time algorithm for doing some particular thing, then it's difficult to do. That's, that's uh, sort of the, the simple way to say it. But the caveat with this is two. First of all, all of these theorems uh, are on classical. Uh, I'm not necessarily talking about quintessence. What, what I should really say is that uh, near vacuum. You're, right? it's, it's much easier to find. I'm speculating cosmologically. Yeah, rolling. Ro but. You, you could be rolling in a case where you don't have a tractable quintessence model, which is why I did not say quintessence. But the uh, word quintessence means just rolling, so that's what I wanted to make sure you understand. So just rolling the vacuum, rolling maybe, and not stable is the same thing. Yeah, so may, maybe what I mean is that it's easy to find near vacua, and when you find near vacua, you're going to tend to roll because there's some downward direction. You're on a, you're on a slope. Yeah. There, yeah, yeah. So there's cause. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess what I mean, based on what I said here, it's not clear that you can that uh, that the quintessence that, that the model you would get from this is a quintessence model that can account for dark energy today in our universe. It's yeah, I, I'm I'm just being careful. <laughs> uh, yeah, right. So uh, some of them are quite potentially models of that type, but I do not have anything to say about that right now. One question is whether quantum computing changes the story. So all of these things are classical algorithms. Uh, I thought that that might be a, a, a big, big caveat. I don't know. I read something in Douglas Deneff 06 uh, that in many cases where you, ex if, if, if an algorithm goes like T, then, the, then you don't get much better than a root T in the quantum computing world. There are exceptions to those cases, but there's, there's sort of papers about typical quantum speed up of particular types of problems uh, when you go from a classical computer to a quantum computer, and I refer you to them for that. Um, but in some sense, the other thing is, is that this is what we're talking about here is worst case complexity. As we've talked about multiple times, uh, some vacua may be easier to find. So this story does not necessarily. Uh, if it is true that cosmology is utilizing computational complexity to select certain types of states over others, it does not immediately tell you that you're not in a vacuum. What it tells you is that if you're in a vacuum, it's, you're in one of the ones that's easier to find. This is the analog, uh, uh, for example, of some proteins fold much faster than others via various mechanisms, but a typical protein, if you synthesize it in a lab, takes a lot longer to fold. So, uh, or, or put differently, some of the subcases of the general problems we studied were actually in P. 
So uh, maybe I'll leave it there and uh, say thanks a lot. I don't understand this last point. Also, I think also the deeper. I don't understand that because uh, I don't understand in which sense our universe would have to have found a pattern. If I accept <coughs> by our classic view of an eternally inflating uh, landscape where mm -hmm. we are just in one of the many patches, mm -hmm. in which sense has the universe found a vacuum? I mean, all the others are also exist, existing, and we just live in one of them. Yeah, I mean, th so I don't see the problem because the universe has not really solved the problem of finding the vacuum with one of the constant. It has produced a large set of vacua uh -huh. in different regions of the universe. Yes, and we have to live in one of them. And so uh, I don't see any problem. I don't see that there's that there is a, a machine capable of solving this problem in this sense. I'm not sure I understand. Because basically, it's not the rat about your talk. It's about the. I think oh. The it's about about the recent paper, but, but about this, I think this, this is what he means in his last uh, talk. He's just the using their paper. logic here. He's yeah, just I, I'm, I'm using their logic. I mean, I guess in some, I, I really, I, the last couple of weeks, I've really focused on pinning down these results. When, when I've thought about this problem, I've just thought about it from the point of view of physics is a particular algorithm that is dynamically evolving the universe, and there's a question of whether you actually reach a particular type of state. If you rephrase the problem in the context of finding that type of state, and you find that that question is computationally complex, then there's, there's a question of how it was that physics did it. Um, I, I, I yeah. want to say that uh, the universe we live in yes. is not necessarily, even though we live in it and we see observe it, it's not obvious how to formulate it such that the universe actually found that one uh, vacuum. I in a, in a, in a, the multiverse uh, allows you to not select our vacuum uh -huh. as a result of computation. Because it could realize other vacua. Yes, yes, yes. Because yes. yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, I so I, I will say I, I do not fully understand the multiverse. So I, I don't know. Yeah. So the universe we live in is evolving, right? Right. So, so there is a, there is an issue. What, uh, different initial conditions. If, if I may make one final comment, I mean, so there's, so it is. And again, I keep citing this paper. The, Douglas and F do discuss this in their first paper. There are known physical systems where there is more rapid relaxation to a global minimum than you might expect because of special properties of the problem. That's what happens with protein folding. But there's other cases where, uh, where, uh, for example, spin glasses. There's a landscape of spin glasses where there's sort of a very slow relaxation and it never reaches its global minimum, even though finding its global minimum is is complex. So. I don't necessarily know which one the answer is, but it seems to be that if the dynamics is in some sense thinkable about in, in a complexity framework, uh, you know, having special subcases that are easier to find or either slowly moving and not really getting to the solution is, is sort of two natural possibilities. And whether that, w which one of those occurs, if, if either in string theory is obviously, requires really getting a handle on the full ensemble of scalar potentials from string theory and questions like this. But, that's a very hard question. What seems clear to me is that there's already complexity issues sort of across the board, mm -hmm. nested complexity issues. Yeah. Early on, there was a question you said you might try to get back to it at the end about quantum computing. About, oh yeah, I mean, just, just here, that was it. Um, so, so all of the assumption of classical complexity theory is that you're using a classical computer. There are quantum versions of complexity theory, and you can ask, can quantum algorithms that are not a deterministic Turing machine uh, can they give you some speed up? Uh, the thing that I do not understand, but I, I have read, is that uh, it's not automatically the case that you do way better on a quantum computer. Uh, t on a classical computer, time t, might go like root t. But if you're exponential, the difference between e to the n and e to the n over 2 is still exponential. So I don't have much more to say about it than that, just because uh, I've been learning this other stuff, not about quantum computing in the last few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I just have one comment. So sure. certainly these are beautiful techniques and the way to think about comp comp computational complexity. I think it's great that you're educating us about the methods and how to think yeah. about them in general about context. Uh, though I think that one thing I want to point out is that the issue we want is the last question you raised there in terms of, I mean, that's a precondition. As For sure, absolutely. Out, as you carefully pointed out. But 
usually what happened, and in fact this was one of the motivation for Swamp Land, mm -hmm. because of the difficulty of that one, people reverted to the first point and start studying this and call this vacuum. Yes. Vacuum. Yeah, yeah. And it began to get the flavor of its physics, which is not, in the sense that the actual physics is the last question. And uh, so the distinction of the, what is the physics criteria versus what's the random potential is a big one, and that's a motivation for Swamp Land, like, just to just the comment. That, that, that's absolutely, and one thing we plan to address in the paper is concrete cases where you run into complexity issues on the bottom question. In some sense, those were the things that were, at least to me, quite expected, so I focused on the other stuff, but yeah, well, you right, right, right. Say, yeah. It's a psychological fallback. The problem is hard. You come up with a toy model which you think is close enough, yeah. and it may not be close enough. That's the, that's the worry sometimes. Certainly controlling all relevant corrections to the effective potential is one of the most important. And, and, yeah. Yeah. and it could be misleading us sometimes. Right. Any other questions? OK, let's thank you again.